good morning everyone <coughs> morning everyone good morning how are you doing sir happy sunday to you sir Minister Ay, thanks so much for yesterday. I bow my before, before your throne. I know, I know my life is not my own. I offer this song of praise. Thank you, Jesus, for this glorious day. Pleasure. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I seek the, gift. Oh, no. the gift. My heart's desire is to seek you above <clears throat> all earthly things. Father, we give glory and honor to you this morning for bringing us to the end of the last week of the month and the last and the last and the, the first half of the year. We bow our knees before your throne, and we know that our life is not our own. Lord, we offer you these songs of praise. Blessed be your name, Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you for today, the 27th of June. We are glad that we are alive. Blessed be your name. I seek the give, not the gift. My heart's desire is to lift you up above. All earthly kings to bring you pleasure, Lord. Hallelujah! 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 Oh, Hallelujah! Hallelujah! Glory to 
the King. Hallelujah. 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 Glory to the King. Lord, we give honor and glory to you this morning. In you we live, we move, and have our being. Thank you for being God and God alone in our life. Blessed be your name. Hallelujah. Welcome to this platform today. Let me just put on my speaker. I, I want to. I want to um, use my speaker now. I hope you can hear me very clearly now. Today is the last Sunday in the year, sorry, in the first half of the year, the month of June. And this year has been on a 100 meters race, just running and running and running. And I am so glad and excited to be alive. I'm so glad to be here this morning and uh, be used by God to be a blessing to his people. I am not here because I am the best preacher on earth or I am better than any one of us. I'm only here by grace and by the call of God on my life. And I'm so glad that God has given me very amazing people who are tireless. They are tireless. They tirelessly pursuing the knowledge of the world. And today, God is set to speak to you and I. God is set to lift your burdens. God is set to change your life. God is set to transform you. God is set to enlarge and expand you. God is set to fill your heart with joy. I don't know what it is that the sound is low. Is it still low like this? Is it still, still low? Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Is, is it still low? Can you help me check, um, Minister AY, if the sound is still low? Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Good morning. It's better now. Okay. A call was coming in and uh, on my um, messenger. So I think it just dampened the volume of the broadcast. So God is set to do an amazing thing today. And if time permits us, I'm going to lead us to pray as well. And uh, I want us to pray and just... Uh, set the pace for the next half of the year and build on the wings of prayer. Hallelujah. We're going to end the teaching we began last four weeks and the Lord has already given me the title for next month. It's going to be explosive. We have been looking at destiny fulfillment. Destiny fulfillment. And we have had very powerful sessions. Very powerful sessions. And I have been blessed tremendously. We're living in a generation where the word of the Lord is becoming scarce. There is no famine greater than the famine of the world. There is no famine greater than the famine of the word of God. And today, God has given me a word that will quench every thirst or any thirst or hunger in the heart of men. And I want you to open your heart to it as we look at the last section of this teaching. And the title of today's teaching is Building on the Word for Destiny Fulfillment. Building on the Word for Destiny Fulfillment. So I'm live now on Instagram as well. I'm live on YouTube. So if you cannot join us on Facebook, I want to connect on Instagram. Just search me out, Ayo Akirile, and then you see me live on Instagram or YouTube. Go to our YouTube channel, Rema for Living Ministries, and you will see me live. You can just subscribe as well so that anytime I'm online, you're going to get a notification. Praise the Lord. So let's just go into the teaching today. Hallelujah. Building on the word for destiny fulfillment. And our anchor scripture will be taken from Joshua chapter 1 verse 8. Joshua 1 verse 8 says, 
This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate in it day and night, that you may observe to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous and you will have good success. God had just transferred the mandate for taking the nation of Israel from the wilderness to Canaan. The original plan that God had for Moses was not to end the journey in the wilderness. God never bargained with Moses that his journey was going to end in the wilderness. It was Moses' disobedience that cost him Canaan. God had a bargain with Moses to take the Israelites from Egypt to Canaan. But Moses disappointed God, disobeyed God, and God switched to Joshua. And I thought extensively about the thing that, that, that Moses did, the significance of what Moses did. Someone will say, what, what did Moses do? I mean, he just disobeyed God. God was too harsh on Moses. You don't know what is happening. The price of leadership is huge. The price of leadership is huge. When God is raising and training his leaders, God is not training the leaders for now. He's training the leaders for the future. God trains leaders for now because of people coming in the future. So when God is training leaders, their training packages are different. The things that people who are leaders will do and get away with. You as a leader, when you do them, God is going to discipline you. Why? Because leaders shape values. Leaders shape values values what leaders do is what people will do and copy so god doesn't try to raise and build the wrong precedence so when a leader does what is wrong god will discipline him so as to serve as an instructional manual for the next generation that if you two do the same thing i will discipline you so as a leader you've got to be responsible so what moses did was to set a wrong precedent you can get to a point in God that you become familiar with God. God had used Moses to do some of the greatest miracles. The world has never seen. I have never had it in history that any man of God prayed and a, an ocean parted into two. So Moses did phenomenal things and he got used to God. Don't get used to God, my friend. Don't get familiar with God. And he got too familiar with God. And God said, no, 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 no. I am going to correct this wrong impression. I am going to correct this wrong impression. You are not going to the Canaan land. You are not going Moses. If God had permitted Moses to enter Canaan land, despite what he had done, God would not have any moral justification to speak to any other person, any other leader in future who disobeyed God. And God is just. God is upright. Abraham in Genesis 18, when he was negotiating the destiny of Sodom and Gomorrah, he said something to God. He said, far be it from you. Far be it from you that the righteous should be as the wicked. For shall not the judge of the old earth do right? Shall not the judge of the old earth do right? God will always be just. He will always be fair. So God will not and will never allow a leader he has raised to get away with irresponsibility. He will not do it. Forget about people who are telling you it doesn't mean anything. Grace has covered it. I have never seen any leader, genuine man of God, not fake people, not charlatans, genuine man of God who disobeyed God and didn't pay a price for it, including myself to the glory of God. I have paid some very, very heavy prices for disobeying God. Some prices can even cost people their lives. That God will tell you, I am done with you. Prepare and come home. <laughs> it won't be your portion in Jesus' name. So God was raising a new generation of a leader in Joshua. And God called Joshua. After God had given Joshua all the other instructions. This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth. 
you're going to meditate in that book day and night. And by meditating and by doing what is in that book, you will prosper and have good success. And I was asking myself the question, the assignment God was giving to Joshua was a military assignment. Joshua was going to fight war. What has the book of the law gotten to do with fighting war? Joshua had soldiers. Joshua had armies. Joshua had weapons. Why was God telling Joshua, this book of the law will determine how you prosper and your success in this war you are going to fight? Because Joshua was going to fight with the Amalekites, with the Hittites. He wasn't just going to have an easy ride into, into Canaan. He was going to, going to fight battles. So God was saying to Joshua, you have to get married to my word. You have to stay glued to my word. You have to be a friend of my word. By doing that, you will prosper and have good success. Now let's go, let's let's disaggregate this scripture. Joshua 1:8. God said to Joshua, This book of the law, what was the book of the law? At that time, God was speaking to Joshua, Jesus had not died. The time of grace had not come. The only book they had were the five books of Moses, the Pentateuch, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. These five books were written by Moses. They represent the book of the law. The book of the law is a generic term for the first five books of the Bible where God gave laws, all kind of laws to the Israelites, the ceremonial laws. The hygiene laws, all the feast of tabernacles, the laws that guide them, the feast of weeks, the feast of Pentecost, all of those laws that God gave them, the Ten Commandments, they make the book of the law. So in our own language today, I can say what God was saying to Joshua was, my word shall not depart from you. To make it easier for us, God was telling Joshua, my word shall not depart from you. If you will prosper and have success, my word shall not depart from you. Not just reading my word now, like a chemistry or biology or a mathematics textbook. You are going to be serious. You've got to be serious. Your prosperity in your destiny, your success in your destiny depend on your relationship to my word. Now, God said something that triggered me, that's, that thrilled me. By your, through your relationship with my word, you will determine good success. By staying glued to my word, you will have good success. I said good success. If there is good success, it means there is bad success. So what the world calls success is not what God calls success. So God was telling Joshua, in destiny fulfillment, in fulfilling your call, in doing my work, you have to be sure you understand what success is. So God used the word good success. Good success. Joshua 1.8. And I'm going to spend a few minutes on that section. Let us go very deep into what it means. Good success. Good success. Now, we are living in a world where a lot of things are happening. Abortion laws have been passed in many nations. In America, in Great Britain, and in some other Western nations. Abortion is legal. The country celebrates it. A lot of people in those countries celebrate it. It is success. When the laws were passed, it was success. The laws, the country had achieved success by supporting people who wish to terminate pregnancies or terminate babies. But you and I know that as believers in Christ, when you terminate a baby, abortion is a sin against God. So what the world celebrates as success, in the context of the Bible, of God's word, it is murder. Murder. You are killing babies. It's a sin against God. So when God was telling Joshua, your relationship to my word is what will determine your success, whether it will be bad or good. So, you can succeed and your success is a bad success. Because the parameters that the world employs 
for determining and measuring success. In most cases, those parameters are not God's parameters. Luke 16, 15 says, The things that are highly celebrated among men are an abomination with God. So what God looks at is not what men look at. So God was telling Joshua, don't determine your success in life using the world's parameters. Make sure you are glued to my word. By being glued to my word, you will understand my thoughts about success. You will understand my passion about success. You will understand my boundaries about success. What is success in the world? In some cases, or in most cases, is failure with God. Human beings celebrate success as the accumulation of money, fine cars, beautiful houses. I can travel the world over. I know governors. I know presidents. I have this. I have that. I have a PhD. Those things are not sinful on their own. <laughs> but when you are dealing with God Almighty and destiny fulfillment, you need to understand that the parameters for measuring success on earth, they are different from the parameters that God employ for measuring success. So when God was speaking to Joshua, because all of us here, yeah, we are Joshua's today. And God is telling us, don't subscribe to the world's parameters for measuring success. That is exactly where the problem is in the church today. We have a lot of ministers, pastors, who do not understand the parameters for ministerial success. You are successful as a minister when you have big churches. Having a big church is not a sin, but that is not God's parameters for measuring success in ministry. You are successful as a minister if you have traveled to 500 countries, 200 countries, preaching the gospel. Traveling the whole world is not a sin. There is nothing wrong in taking the gospel from place to place, but that is not the parameter. All of these things, money, crowd, influence, travel, cars, houses, buildings, they are not the end. They are the means to an end. So if you as a pastor, you, you, you turn means to an end, to your end, you miss it. So when you wake up in the morning and all you are pursuing, all you are running after, all you want to get is more money, more crowd, more influence, you have missed it. That is the number one definition of failure. So you don't pursue the tool. You pursue what you want to use the tool to achieve. That is where a lot of ministers make the mistake. And so what? I'm building a big church. Am I not building God's kingdom? Not necessarily. You can be building the biggest church auditorium in the world and you're not building 1% of God's kingdom. Because in your arts, you are building that building because you want fame. You want the world to know you have the biggest church. Even though you are saying to people, I'm building God's kingdom. But right in the corner of your heart, when you are in your room, you yourself, you know it, that you are competing. You want to be number one. You want to have the largest congregation. It is not because you love the kingdom. You just love the fame. The fame that comes with having the biggest. It's a very tricky thing. A lot of people start very well. When they get to a certain phase in their ministry, they are derailed. Because they don't understand what ministerial success is. What is ministerial success? Racing human beings. Sorry. Racing people to become like Christ. Q-E-D. Your definition for success as far as ministry is concerned. Anywhere they find you as a minister of God and you speak, anything they see about you, your ministry, your messages, your tapes, TV, your children, your marriage, everything about you should turn people from the devil to God. In other words, the totality of your life should draw men to God. That is all. It's not complicated. <laughs> your life should turn men to God. Your life should turn men to God. Everything about you, anytime people encounter you, either they listen to you, or they read your books, or they listen to your CD, or you are speaking on the TV, or you're on social media, or in your marriage, they visit your home. Anywhere people see you, 
your life must turn them to God. You must always be a vessel that show God to people. When they see you, they want to know God more. When they see you, they want to serve God more. When they see you and they are in sin, they want to repent. Your, your life is convicting people of sin and they want to come to God. Every other thing you are doing, traveling the world over, going to Jerusalem for pilgrimage, buying the biggest Bible concordance, driving limousine, buying 100 jets, all of those things are immaterial. If the ultimate objective, if the ultimate metric for determining success, which is to turn people to God, if you are not achieving it, forget it. You have missed the definition of success in ministry. And this same thing applies to everyone because every believer is called. You don't have to be on the pulpit to be a minister. To be a minister is to be a servant. So you can be an engineer and you are a minister. You are serving your engineering skill to the world. You can be a politician and you are a minister. Daniel was not a minister. Daniel was a politician. Yet, everywhere you found Daniel, Daniel was a light in Babylon. They looked for everything to convict Daniel. The Bible says they didn't find anything. Daniel was so excellent that they had to cook up a story. The story they cooked up was he was praying. They didn't have any means of convicting him. So his life was convicting them. His life was a challenge to them. This guy was too good. And Daniel was not born again. Daniel had no Bible. What an indictment on our generation. This generation had no, has no excuse before God. Apostle Paul was saying something in the book of Romans. I can't remember the chapter. He said, you man, thou art inexcusable. You man, you have no excuse before God. Because we are living in a time of grace where we have everything. We have God the Father. We have God the Son. We have God the Holy Spirit. We have all the Bible translations. We have everything at our beck and call. So you have no excuse before God not to live right. You have no excuse before God not to pray well. You have no excuse before God not to know the word. So when God called Joshua and said, you need to understand what I'm saying, good success. You have to make up your mind to understand that success in the world is not the same as success in Christ. What the world calls success is not what me, God, calls success. A lot of people are pursuing ephemeral things. Laboring and sweating. I was listening to a man of God about five years ago or four years ago. I can't remember exa exactly. And he was using the story of the rich fool. You know the rich fool? The rich fool in the Bible who said, I will build a barn. I will load my barn with food. I will do this. I will do that. And God sent an angel to him. God said, you fool. Tonight, your soul will be required of you. So God was telling us that a man who builds his life around me, myself, and I, I will get, I will get, I will build, I will marry, I will eat, I will buy. It's about me, me, me. That man is not living at all. He's a dead man. That man of God said, a lot of believers, a lot of ministers, when they die, the first statement they will hear from God is, you are a fool. <laughs> I was driving when I, I was listening to his message on my radio. And I shivered. So many people when they die, the first statement they will hear from God is, you are a fool. <laughs> because you live your life for yourself alone. Your definition of success was shaped largely by what you learned from culture. Culture is what is shaping your definition of success. If I ask you today, my friends today, what is your definition of success? If I make the survey anonymous, don't put your name there. Don't put your number there. You will be shocked the definitions you will see. I want to travel to Hawaii. I want to raise a good family. I want to buy nice cars. I want to buy fine houses. I want to get to the top of my career. I want to be the consultant. I want to build. I want... And those things are not sinful. They are not wrong. They are not wrong things. You are not stealing money to get them. They are not wrong. But in the kingdom of God, acquiring things is not the definition of success. Acquiring things 
alone. That is not success in God's kingdom. Jesus said, do not lay up treasures for yourself on earth. Jesus didn't say, do not have treasures. Two different things. Do not lay up. In other words, don't have a reservoir mentality. Don't live for accumulating houses. Don't live for accumulating money. When there is a need around you, when there are poverty, there are poor people around you, be a channel. Don't be a reservoir. So a believer, a minister who has a channel mentality is someone who is pursuing success as far as God is concerned. Money is coming. Influence is coming. Properties are coming. Your career is growing. Your church is growing. But your life is leading men to God. You are influencing, impacting. You are helping people, feeding the poor. And your life is a channel. When people come in contact with you, something must drop on them. By the grace of God, that is how I live my life. To the glory of God. To the best of my ability. And you cannot be my friend for three, for three, three months is too long. Three months is too long. One week. I'll be asking questions. What are you doing? Where are you standing? What do you need? What can I do? Can we pray about it? Oh, I cannot do it. I have a friend who can do it. I will be looking for what to do just to improve your life to the glory of God alone. And this is not a gift. Every believer in Christ should live like this. Every pastor should live like this. When people have problems in the society, and they run to the church, they should have, they should get to their final bus stop. No, people cannot bring their problem to God. And they are telling them, I am not a charity. And then God is not the final bus stop. If God is not the final bus stop, who is the final bus stop? What other bus stops can we create bigger and higher than God? If God is not the final bus stop, who is the final bus stop? So if I, as a pastor, a young lady was telling me, uh, I said, ah, what about your pastor? So he can't do anything. I said, and I've heard that statement several times. I said, so he chased you out. No, no. He said he cannot help. That's uh, the, all can, the same story. We are not charity. We don't have, we can't do anything. I said, ah, but you have a pastor. You have a problem. You cannot eat. You have a managed crisis. You cannot pay your house rent. I go and ask your church for help. My, see, my pastor will not do anything. So where will you go? That is what will push you to prostitution. I said to the lady, you are in a vulnerable position now. You are looking for money anywhere. If any man approaches you and decides to trade your body for his money, you will fall. We have to, we have to find a way of solving that problem that day. Because I didn't want that girl to go out. <laughs> Hallelujah. Your relationship with my word, Joshua, Joshua, be careful. The definition of success is, and the world is different from the definition of success in my kingdom. God was shaping the value system of Joshua. Joshua had a huge task. The task was so huge that God had to sit him down and lecture him. You are going to take these people from the wilderness. You are taking them into Canaan. Let me tell you what to do. And God gave Joshua a list of what he will, he will do. The final instruction in that book, in that Joshua chapter 1, was the word. The word was the final bus stop. Your relationship to my word shapes how prosperous you will, you will be and it will give you good success if you relate well with my word. When same-sex marriage was endorsed in America, thousands and millions of people, they trooped out celebrating it. The American government celebrated their success. Planned, planned parenthood celebrated their success. Now, is, we have sex, same-sex marriage laws in Ireland, in the country of Ireland with the capital being Dublin, about three or, three or four years ago, they passed same-sex marriage laws. And I read it in the newspaper. 
People trooped out of their houses celebrating. We have achieved success. In the world, man and man or woman and woman getting married is success. In the kingdom of God, in the scripture, in the Bible, it is one of the most vicious offenses. One of the most deadly things a generation can do. In fact, God destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah because of same-sex marriage. So, in the kingdom of this world, same-sex marriage is a success. In the word of God, it is failure. So, when God was telling Joshua, good success is different from success. What they call success may not be good success in my own world. Hallelujah. God sent Saul, one of the most, one of the stories in the Bible that always want to make me cry is the story of Saul. Saul, tell me a young man that got favored and I will mention Saul. Tell me a young man that got blessed and I will mention Saul. God gave Saul an instruction. Go and wipe out the Amalekites. Kill the king. Kill the women. Kill the children. Kill the husband. Kill the wives. Kill the animals. What did Saul do? Saul went to the war. Saul fought. Saul labored. Saul risked his life. Saul spent money. Saul killed people. Saul killed a lot. He did a lot of things. But he spared King Agag. Or Hagar and spared the best of animals. When God came to Samuel, God said, I regret that I have made Saul king. God will regret over you. Ah! There are two gentlemen in the Bible that anytime I read their story, I feel like crying. Saul and Judas. I regret that I have made Saul king. Because he has turned back from following me. I said, wait a minute. Saul did not turn back from following God. God gave Saul an instruction. Saul obeyed the instruction. He only spared some animals. In the principle, in the kingdom of God, by the principle of the kingdom, partial obedience is the same as complete disobedience. Partial obedience in the Bible in the kingdom of God, is equivalent to complete disobedience. God said to Samuel, Saul has turned from following me. Saul did not turn from following God in our own eyes. But God said, I gave him instruction, 10 instructions. He carried out eight. He didn't carry out two. So there is nothing like you can't be cherry picking instructions with God. I will do this. I won't do that. I will do this. I won't do that. That was what finished Saul. In 1 Samuel chapter 15, verse 21 and 22, Samuel came to Saul. Samuel said, Does the Lord ask pleasure in the fat of animals like in obeying the voice of the Lord? For to obey is better than sacrifice and, and to act in than the fat of rams. For for stubbornness is as idolatry. And disobedience is like witchcraft. Building on the world for destiny fulfillment. That is today's teaching, the last of the series. Building on the world. Now, let me tell you something. And I began to think about this scripture. Why was God connecting the world? with the success of Joshua. I asked that question. It was a very honest question. There are so many people in the world who are not Christians. They don't study the Bible. They don't pray. They are not born again. And they are succeeding. Don't, don't, don't forget that I said to us, success in the world is different from success in God's kingdom. Bill Gates is one of the richest in the world. He was the richest before. He's still one of the richest. I've never heard that Bill Gates prays or studied the Bible. Elon Musk or Elon Musk. 
Warren Buffett, Mark Zuckerberg. Some of these guys are holding the world on the palm of their hand. They are the one controlling the whole world. Some of these guys. In fact, if you put three, four, five of them together, more than 50% of the world's economy is in their pocket. Yet they don't study the world. So I was asking God, why are you saying that Joshua should make the world a priority when there are people who are not studying the world and they are equally at the top? I believe the Lord will just smile because God can smile. God smiles. God laughs anyway. <laughs> and I began to drill down. You know the reason why God was telling Joshua to build on the world. Let the world, the other people in the world, who are getting to the top of their career, let them, let them ignore the word of God and get to the top. I will tell you what's going to happen now. First Corinthians chapter 2, verse 6 says, listen to this scripture. First Corinthians chapter 2, verse 6. This is a scripture you, you must not forget. Very powerful scripture. We speak wisdom in a mystery. Not the wisdom of this world, nor of the princes of this world that come to naught. Let me make it simple. We speak wisdom in a mystery. Not the wisdom of this world, nor of the princes of this world that comes to zero. Ah, the wisdom of the princes of this world is coming to zero. First Corinthians 2 verse 6. The wisdom of the princes of this world is coming to zero. Many of many, many, many people have not seen this scripture before. I have quoted him some years back when I was teaching like this. The princes of this world, who are they? Not just spiritual princes. So we have economic princes of this world, we have financial princes of this world, we have political princes of this world. The people who control governments, who control nations, who control economy, the people who dominate the World Bank, the people who take decisions for the whole world at the United Nations, the G7 nation, the G8 nation, the World Economic Forum, the UNESCO, the WTO, World Trade Organization. These are the princes of this world. The Bible says their wisdom is coming to zero. 1 Corinthians 2 verse 6. Their wisdom is coming to zero. I can spend the next five hours teaching on this one verse of the Bible. Because a lot of Christians don't actually understand what this statement means. The princes of this world are the people who are at the top of everything. They build their career. They get to the top. They are shaping the world. They are controlling the world. But they don't have God. They are coming to zero. Why? It is appointed unto man once to die. And after this, judgment. Michael Jackson dominated the music world for several years. Michael Jackson died at 48. He was a prince of music. Where is Michael Jackson today? Where is the money he made from his estate? The wisdom of the princes of this world is coming to zero. Whitney Houston, whom I love so dearly, where is she today? She died at 48. She sang what musicians call peerless vocals. Peerless. That woman was peerless. Where is she today? The wisdom of the princes of this world are coming to zero. George Benson, Hammy Winehouse, Mama Gaddafi, Saddam Hussein. Mention the political princes of this world. Name them. Abraham Lincoln, George Washington, Winston Churchill. Mention the political princes of this world and mention where they are today. They are gone. All the, all the professors, all the IT gurus, 
all the people that are holding this world on their hands, if they die without Jesus, their wisdom is coming to zero. <laughs> it is coming to zero. So you can achieve anything you want to achieve without God. You can build the biggest businesses in the world, buy all the estates, regardless of what you do, you are going to die and face the judgment of God. And if you are not in Christ, your wisdom is coming to zero. That was exactly what God was saying to Joshua. Forget about these guys that are chasing success, chasing success, chasing it, chasing it with reckless abandon without God. And when you see Christians discuss these things on social media, after all, Bill Gates doesn't pray. Prayer is not important. Don't, don't mix things up. Life is governed by principles. That is true. But you and I are not just here on earth because of principles. We are here on earth, one, first, to influence this world by principles, and two, to build a relationship with God for our eternity. Because life doesn't end on earth. That is the difference between you and a Chinese billionaire who doesn't pray. The Chinese billionaire doesn't pray, who doesn't read scripture, who is not saved. He has no part in the kingdom of God. That is the Bible. I didn't write it. The Bible says, whosoever name was not found in the book of life shall be cast into outer darkness where there shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. I didn't write the Bible. So, Pursuing success in the world without a world foundation is tantamount to zero because at the end of the day, you are going to be a loser. If you die in this world without Christ, it is a loser. It's a loser's game. Loser's game. There are some football matches. They call them loser's game. They have selected the winners who will qualify from the group. They will not play loser's game. <laughs> so sometimes, some of those coaches, they won't use their, their, their best players because the results don't matter. Again, they can't qualify anyway. So let's just play this final game. You are four in a group. You have lost the first three matches. You have already lost out. So the last game is just mere formality. Let me just play the last game. If you refuse to play that game, FIFA will find you. So some Coaches will just excuse their best players and they will use some of their new players just to test. So Jesus said to the apostles, what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and lose his soul? For what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? So success without God <laughs> is leading to zero. Everything you build on earth ends there. When they, are, when they are burying you when you are old and you are buried and they put your gold, they put your wristwatches, they put your car. I have had cases where in Africa, they buried a rich man with money. And when they went away, the people came back. They, they removed the corpse and removed all the money. For we brought nothing into this world and it is certain we taking nothing out. So a life that is rooted in the word of God, relationship with Christ, because essentially what I'm saying is build on God. Have a strong affinity in the word of God. Make the word your bound. If it must not, if it is not found in the world, it must not be found in your world. If it is not found in the world, it must not be found in your world. When you live like that, you are not just building for time, you are building for eternity because life does not end here. You know the second reason why you must not pursue success without the word of God. Second Corinthians chapter 5 verse 10 says, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ and give an account of what we have done, whether good or bad. So for a believer in Christ, you know that your life doesn't just end on earth. The unbeliever, the atheist, they don't believe that. So that is why they don't need God. They kick God out. You and I know, and we know, and we are sure, and we, and we know that when you and I leave this world, we are going to face God's judgment. 
the judgment being spoken about in 2 Corinthians 5.10 is not the judgment of the whole world. It's the judgment of believers. Where are the words and our words will be given to us based on how we have spent our life on her. So when you build on the word, while you are on earth, yeah, the word of God will shape your thinking. The word of God will teach you how to walk in integrity. The word of God will teach you how to be faithful. The word of God will teach you how to be kind. The word will teach you how to show love. The word will teach you how to exercise and exhibit self-control. The word will teach you how to run your marriage. The word will teach you how to raise your children. The word will teach you how to give to others. And you will live a balanced, impactful, influential life. There is a man, a very rich man. I won't mention his name. Very rich billionaire in America. He became rich. He got to the top of his career. Of course, without God. I don't need God. I don't need God, all this foolish, stupid, religious madness. I am very educated. I built my brand. I built this. And he truly, he built the brand. He's a billionaire. He employed thousands of people. He's solving problems for the world. After building that business to the top, one day they discovered that he's been having an affair with a woman. Multiple women, not one woman. He's been having an affair. And suddenly, the business began to crack. Friends began to withdraw. Partners began to withdraw. Shame began to come. Now as I'm talking now, the matter can get to court. Now, if you have built your business, your ministry on the word of God, will adultery be part of your equation? The word of God will shape your character. The word of God will teach you how to exercise self-control. The word of God will help you to overcome adultery and sexual sin. The word of God will guide you. That is what the word of God does. Jesus said in John 6, 63, it is the spirit that quickens. The flesh profits nothing. The word that I speak to you as spirit and life. The words, the words that I speak to that, that word is now in the Bible. They are spirit. Spirit. So it is not just the letter. It's the spirit. The word of God is spirit. And that word brings transformation. Every book on earth will inform you only the word of God can transform you. And information is eternally inferior to transformation. Information is good, very good, but it's on a lower cadre than transformation. Hallelujah. So you and I know that we're going to give, face God and give an account. So that is where the word of God comes to guide and shape us. To manage our resources very well because I am going to give an account. The word of God teaches that we are stewards. Anything you own or have is not your own. You are just a steward. You are just a manager of God's resources because you know that that is what the word says. And you have that word in your mind and in your heart. It will guide you to know how to manage your income, your salary, your properties, your business, to manage it judici judiciously, to benefit yourself and benefit humanity. You know what? Sometimes you are preaching and some things come to your mind. You want to say them. They say, no, I won't say it. Because you, are, you have to be in the spirit when you are ministering. So you don't say things that are out of the flesh. So what I want to say, I won't say it. <laughs> number two. No, number three. We've spoken about... The wisdom of this world is coming to zero. That is the first reason why you and I must be rooted in the world. Don't pursue success without God. Number two, we've spoken about we are going to give an account. The people who are not pursuing God, who don't respect the world, who are not in Christ, they are pursuing success, but when they die without Christ, the Bible says they are on their way to hell. God doesn't send anybody to hell. 
God doesn't send anybody to hell. God created hell for Satan and his demons. People choose to go to hell when they reject Jesus' finished work on the cross. God doesn't send anyone to hell. God has made a way of escape. This is my son in whom I am well pleased. Hear him. Human beings say, we don't want Jesus. When you reject Jesus, you, 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 have, you have accepted hell. So God is not the one sending people to hell. God is love. It's true. He wants us to go to heaven through Jesus. I don't want Jesus. No problem. No problem. He doesn't force anyone. Number three. The number three reason why you and I have to pursue our vision, our success, our career with the word of God as a foundation is that a believer in Christ is not just raised by God to live for himself. You are raised by God to live for God and for others too. And ultimately, your life should lead other people to Christ. Your life and my life should lead other people to Christ. The people in the world who don't know God, who are not in Christ, they don't live that. They don't believe that. They don't live that. that. They, don't, they don't build their businesses because they want to lead people to Christ. That is not their business. The only reason why they are in business is to make money. I am not in business because of money alone. I am not an engineer because of money alone. I am not a fashion designer because of money alone. I am not a lawyer because of money alone. A believer in Christ is not driven by money alone. You are driven by the fear of God. You are driven by the love for God. You are driven by the passion to help other people. So even at times, you will be forced to do things for people, not because of money, but because you want them to come to Christ. That mindset can only be received by being rooted in the world. The people in the world, they don't think like that because they are not rooted in the world. So they just follow and pursue their success just to buy more houses, to have more cars, to have more influence, and they die, and everything just fizzles out. Not for you and I. Hallelujah. You can now see why God was telling Joshua, my word must be your bond. Make sure you don't pursue success. This assignment I am giving you, Joshua, don't pursue this assignment without a solid foundation in my word. Joshua 1.8. Make sure that this book of the law, you meditate in it, you observe it, you do it. By doing that, you will prosper and you will have good success. God did not say, I will prosper you. He said, you will determine your prosperity, you. I say, I preached about this in the first week. So a lot of Christians are waiting for God and God is waiting for them. There is nothing more deadly than that. That you are waiting for God and God is actually waiting for you. <laughs> and you are waiting 10 years, God will do it. 15 years, God will do it. 30 years, and God will say, I've been waiting for you for the past 30 years. You have my grace, you have instruction, you have the Bible, the Holy Spirit is in you, is guiding you, is giving you instructions, you are doing nothing. You are waiting on God to come and do it for you. We have a God will do it generation in Africa. The headquarters of God will do it generation is in Africa. That is the headquarters of God will do it generation. That is the more reason why a lot of people in the Western society, they are far better than Africa. The headquarters of God we do it is in Africa. We don't do anything. We don't want to do anything. To build hospitals, God will do it. To build roads, God will do it. To give scholarship to people, God will do it. I am a billionaire. I have money. I have a church. I have 10,000 members in my church. 80% of them are poor. 
And all I'm telling them is pray, pray. God will do it. God will do it. God will bless you. Do give. So see, give. Pay your tithe. I have 10 billion in my accounts. I have properties. I have houses all over the world. If I sell one of my houses, I can sponsor 5,000 people. I won't do it. But pray, pray. Lift up your hand. Stretch your hand. Touch the altar. Touch my seat. But I won't go into my accounts to withdraw money and give to the people. <laughs> so the people are on the same spot. I went to a particular church in Nigeria. And I met friends in that church. About 20 years, about 16 years after I left that church, the people I left there, I look at some of them, not even some of them, all of them, they are still on the same spot. They are still on the same spot. Poor, battered, tattered, hungry, this, in fact, worse. Not on the same spot. They are worse. I one day I was watching a program and the, a, the man of God ministry was telling them, stretch your hand, receive it, receive it, receive it. You will prosper. And the people are praying. I said, after 16 years, and I called a friend of mine. I said, this man of God asked this, 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 this. If he gives 10 people this, 30 people this, all the influences he has, he has money, he has this, he will change their lives himself. God has already answered their prayer. They are waiting for God. God is waiting for them. A lot of us, we have the solution to the problem of 1,000, 2,000 people. And we have bound them. Ministers, ministers, ministers. How many times did I call you? May God have mercy on us. May God have mercy on us. May you never be a victim of self-inflicted stagnation. Say a big amen. May you never be a victim of self-inflicted stagnation that you are waiting on God and God is actually waiting for you. You didn't know. That is what the world teaches, the word of God. The word of God teaches that when I have money and people don't have money, I should take out of my money and give them to help them. That doesn't require fasting and prayer. It doesn't require any impartation. The only impartation is to impart my money to them. Take that money. What am I doing with 100 houses? 10 of those houses will solve the problem of 1 million people without them praying and fasting. Many of our pastors will not do it. Africa is the headquarters of God will do it generation. The headquarters. That is why Africa is backward. Backward. But when you are rooted in the world as anything, as a minister, as a preacher, as, an, as a banker, your entire life will be rooted in the value system of scripture. The value of love. The value of self-control. The value of peace. The value of patience, the value of faithfulness, the value of endurance. And you will be dissipating those values to people. Anywhere you are, when people meet you and they are crying, they will smile. To the glory of God. To the glory of God. Everything I say, I say, I say them to the glory of God. Except if I don't have the means. And I don't have the means all the time because I'm not God. I'm limited. Except if I don't have the means. Men or women will cry into my house, into my space, and I have the solution to that problem, and I won't solve that problem. Except I don't have the means. Except, and it is true, I have not had the means in so many other cases. And I tell the people, I, I cannot help you. I don't have money. Okay, what can we do? Because let me pray with you. Okay. Uh, let me let me advise you. Oh, can you talk to somebody? Oh, blah blah blah. But if I have the means, and somebody cries into my door, and you can't go away like that. <laughs> you cannot. <laughs> ah, I won't be able to sleep. How did I learn all of that? The word of God. 
the word of God. Apostle John say, how dwelleth the love of God in you? Your brother comes to you, is hungry, and you tell him, be filled, be filled. How dwelleth the love of God in you? That was what John said. How dwelleth the love of God in you? You have billions in your account, properties all over the world. You are a pastor. You have built businesses. The 10% of your wealth, 10% of your wealth can revolutionize a whole city. But you are telling the people, pray, pray, connect, receive it, receive it. How dwelleth the love of God in you? In other words, you don't have love. You don't have love. You're just deceiving people. And nothing provokes love like a life yielded to the word of God. Nothing provokes love like a life genuinely yielded to the word of God. So, let me begin to wind, wind it down now. How do you and I then get married and glued to the world? In this wordless generation, we are living in one of the most wordless generations. They don't want the world. They prefer culture to scripture. And scripture is superior to culture. You cannot be a friend of culture. And at the same time, a friend of scripture, there will be chaos. Culture teaches vengeance. Scripture teaches forgiveness. Culture teaches amassing of wealth. Scripture teaches giving out. So you cannot be a friend to the world and a friend to God. The Bible says friendship with the world is enmity against God. How do you now build a solid world life that will help you shape your destiny? Number one, you must be under a sound pastor for spiritual nourishment and correction. You know what I found out about Africans? Africans, maybe Nigerians most especially, our allegiance is to the pastor and not to God. That is one of the powers of Babel that must collapse in Africa. When men love the pastor more than the God of the pastor, you will know if you love your pastor more than God, when your pastor sees what is wrong and not scriptural, and you are applauding and you laugh and you endorse him. That is what majority of us are doing. Because I love him. And I pity those pastors because when they die and they face God's judgment, none of us will be there. <laughs> a sound pastor is a man of God who elevates the word of God above himself to the people. He elevates the word. Even when he is wrong and people correct him, he is humble enough to say, I'm sorry, what I said was wrong. You won't find that. How many times have you had a man of God in Nigeria say, I'm very sorry, and it comes on the altar. What I said was wrong last week. I'm very sorry. No. They will say it. They will say it. Number two. Now, the thing is that anytime I give an altar call, I always tell people, look for a Bible-believing church. I wish I have a formula for finding a Bible-believing church. I, I, I don't have a formula for it. So I tell people, prayerfully, ask God to lead you to the right church. It has become a matter of prayer now to find the right church. There are plenty of churches. We have only few churches with sound, godly pastors now. Few. And if you just if you are just getting born again, and you find your way into the church, being pastored by a man of God who is not sound, just like being born as a baby into a family where the parents are poor, you will just develop that kind. Your health, your your well being as a baby will be shaped 
by the economic status of your parents. It's the same principle. Your spiritual well-being will be shaped by the spiritual well-being of your pastor. If your pastor is proud, you'll be proud. If your pastor is arrogant, you'll be arrogant. If your pastor is, is worldly, you'll be worldly. If your pastor is humble, you'll be humble. If your pastor is God-fearing, you'll be God-fearing. Because it is a oil. That oil flows from the head to the body. Number two, you must develop an honest heart towards the word of God. Whether it is sweet or it is ash. The Bible is called the double-edged sword. Or the word of God is called the double-edged sword. That's in uh, Hebrews 4 verse 12. The double-edged sword means that it can sweeten you and sometimes it can pierce you. So don't be a believer who is always cherry-picking scriptures. You cherry-pick scriptures. Look for the sweet ones. So you see believers go to Romans. They look for grace. The grace message of Paul. Grace has covered it all. The grace of God. The grace of God. I am like Christ in this world as Christ is in heaven. I am all those beautiful scriptures and they are true. When Paul says it is appointed unto man once to die and after judgment, you don't want to hear it. When Paul says grace teaches us to run from sin, Titus 2, 11, you don't want to hear it. That kind of a believer is dishonest. Honesty of art is one of the greatest Christian character. Honesty of art will help you to balance things. When you are wrong and you are confronted, you will humble yourself to say, I'm sorry. So if you don't have a honest art, you cannot find God. Forget it. God is always in the business of finding people with honest arts. Honest arts. When Abimelech, an unbeliever, unbeliever, Abimelech, took the wife of Abraham. The Bible says God did not allow him to touch the wife of Abraham. So God appeared to him in a dream. The wife, the, man, the, the woman you have just taken is the wife of Abraham. Abimelech said, I didn't know. I did it in the integrity of my heart. God said, I know, I know. Ah, that statement is powerful. I, that means, me too, I check your heart. I check your heart. I know you have integrity. You, you are honest. You didn't know that it was Abraham's wife. I know. Ah, oh my God. In the book of 1 Samuel chapter 3, verse 3, verse 2, the Bible says, 2 verse 3, God is a God of knowledge, and by him, actions are weighed. Actions are weighed. Action is synonymous to the totality of our thoughts, mindsets. They are now produced an action. So when you do anything in the physical, God looks into your heart to know your motive. He weighs you. He weighs you. God told Abimelech, I know. I know now. Don't worry. Just release him to Abraham. If you don't release him, you are a dead man. And Abimelech said, okay, 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 okay. I didn't know now. She told me he was his sister. So I would have no because I know what I know. I know. God has searched his heart. He's always looking for honest heart. Honest heart. So one of the prayers I pray many times is that God give, make my heart more honest. More honest. More honest. More honest. One day, I was preaching because I do a lot of writing. By the grace of God, one of my main areas of skill and grace is writing, writing and speaking. That is my area of grace. So I was teaching about humility. So after I did that message, I made an error in one of my words. And a lady just came to my inbox and she said, can you check this line? You made the mistake. You know what was happening? I had just finished speaking about humility. And somebody I didn't even know came to me to tell me that I was wrong. That I should correct my English. If I was not under the spirit, what would I have done? I just smiled. I said, thank you so much, ma. Thank you. I went back and I corrected it. And the Holy Spirit told me, he said, see that? God will always create an opportunity to prove you, to test your heart. 
You are teaching people about honesty. God will pass the test of honesty through you. You're teaching about pride. God will pass teaching about humility. God will pass the test of pride through you so as to weigh you. God said to Nebuchadnezzar through Daniel, I have weighed you in a balance and you have found one thing. God weighed him. God weighed Nebuchadnezzar. God banished him into the wilderness for seven years, eating grass like animals. I have weighed you. You weigh, you weigh nothing. You weigh nothing. You weigh nothing. Every one of us, we are constantly being weighed by God. Where is God weighing our hearts? How honest are you to my word? When the sweet words come, do you embrace them? When the ash one comes, you change your church. My pastor is too ash. And you want to go to where they will serve you ice cream and they will tell you, divorce your husband, divorce your wife. God loves it. One of my friends came to me one day and he said he was divorcing his wife. What happened? Uh, somebody told me, they found out with a man. I said, did you see her yourself? Uh, do I have to wait to see her? Do I have to wait to catch her? The, my uncle told me, he caught her. They saw her. I said, did you see her yourself? He got um, aggressive with me. That is my own choice. That's my decision. I said, did, did your pastor know about it? I am always wanting to know what the pastor will do. Because you cannot bring that nonsense to me and ask me to endorse it. A lot of women, some, some, some women have come to me in the past asking me to endorse divorce. I will not endorse it though. Me, I won't do. I, I said to them, go and pray. As far as I'm concerned, I can't endorse divorce. I don't break homes. I mend homes by the grace of God. I can't endorse it. Do you know what the man is doing to me? I said, you want to divorce her? I am not the one telling you to do it. Oh, I can't endorse it. <laughs> so my friend was asking me, I said, what about your pastor? He said, yes, I went to pastor. My pastor said, if that is my choice and I want to divorce her, I have the biblical basis. She was caught in adultery. I said, did you catch her? And my uncle told me, I said, what kind of a human being is this? Your uncle told you. I said something to him. I said, when you die, can you defend the decision before God? That you divorce your wife because your uncle told you they saw your wife with another man. They saw your wife in another man in an hotel and you trust that uncle. Can you defend it? Can your pastor defend you? Every man for himself on the day of judgment. He didn't listen to me anyway. He ended up divorcing the woman. But my own hands are clean. My name is not part of that transaction. My name is not part of that transaction. If you want to do it and that is what you are led to do, no problem. But I am not part of that transaction. Honesty of heart. That is one of the pillars on which a solid world life will be built. There was a particular time in my life. I said to God, all the words you are giving me, they are all sweet, sweet words. I said, something is wrong. Because God chastises people. I said, I don't even, I said, I was getting, I was getting uncomfortable. Anytime I'm studying the word, I'm praying, everything I'm hearing is this blessing, that blessing. I said, I don't even get correction. I'm not perfect. Now I make mistakes. I do wrong things. I was getting afraid myself that I hope my heart, because you can get to a point that your heart becomes dishonest and you don't know. The Bible says, when you go to God with an idol in your heart, hide the Lord, I will answer you according to that idol. Meaning that when you have formed your mindset, you have formed your character, you know what you want. You have a particular state of heart that you have developed. When you pray with that heart to God, you will hear answers in line with that heart. So that explains why you see some pastors tell you, the Lord said, the man is doing what is wrong. He will tell you, the Lord said, and he will argue it. He will tell you, I had a revelation. Forgetting that the Bible says, Satan can appear as an angel of light. Satan can transform to Jesus. Not to the real Jesus now. He can transform to a white angel. My daughter, my daughter, I am the Lord. I died for you on the cross. Arise. 
go and divorce your husband and your wife or your wife. I have called you into ministry. And it's Satan as he's talking. <laughs> and it's Satan as he's talking. And you will not know. When you are dealing with the devil, you must lean on the strength of God. The Bible says, be strong in the Lord, not in yourself. Be strong in the Lord because you are dealing with a guy that is at least 6,000 years old. You and I are no match for the devil without Jesus. Except for Jesus, we are bread and butter for Satan. How old are you? How old am I? This guy is at least 6,000 years old, minus the time he spent in heaven. <laughs> he has dealt with billions of people, different shapes. Different sizes. The Americans, the Colombians, the Ghanaians, the Congolese, the Nigerians, the Argentines, the Arabians, the Iraqis, the Iranians, the Syrians. He had dealt with billions of billions of people over the last 6,000 years. Who are you, am I, without Christ? So when you are dealing with him, you have to lean on the strength of God and be deeply rooted in the world. So that when Satan is trying to deceive you and mold your hearts, Towards something that is wrong, do we know? When you have a, a honest heart, even when you are at the brink of making a mistake, God is faithful. God will do something to show it to you that that is wrong. That is wrong. Number three, you must have a definite Bible study approach. Let me tell you what I do. I pick a book of the Bible and I read it through. I pick John. I read it through. I pick Matthew. I read it through. Sometimes I read three at the same time. I spend a lot of times in Psalms because Psalms is very refreshing. Hardly in the morning, like 10 chapters, five chapters of Psalms. When I've done that and I go to John, maybe I'm in chapter five of John, I sit there and I don't rush. I want to advise you, my friends. I want you to desist from the attitude of competing with others in terms of how many scriptures you have read. There is no award or reward for the best Bible reader. There is no award or reward in heaven, even on earth. I have read 10 chapters. I read the whole Bible. If it is only two verses, just have a plan. It is not how far, but how well. It is not. You are not deriving value from the numbers you read, but from the truth and the revelation and rhema that you can capture in the scripture. Sometimes I start from Genesis and I read it down. Genesis, Exodus, and I stop. I don't read like the same book. I like reading from Genesis down until Malachi. I don't do it. That is me and, and, it, and it works for me. And because I read a lot of books, when I'm reading those books, there are many scriptures that are coming as well. Sometimes I just pick the book of Hebrew. Let me study Hebrews. And I stay there for the next, I don't know, two months or whatever. So you must have a plan. You cannot have a Bible. You cannot have a, a career, ca career progression approach. I don't have a Bible study approach. That is not a good life for a Christian. I also want to advise that you create time to buy books. Re leaders are readers. Don't buy books because of fame. Don't buy books because he has the largest church in the world. Don't buy books because he has the largest money. I don't buy books. I buy integrity. That is my principle. Whether you have one billion people in your church or two people, it's not my business. Do you have integrity? And I will know. By the time I'm hearing, he's divorcing second time, divorcing third time, he slapped his secretary. He did this thing. He abused the governor. He abused. I can't buy your books. No matter what, no matter what you are doing, because beneath the letters in your book is your spirit. Beneath the letters in your book is your spirit. So if you are proud and I buy your books, I will be proud. You can write it down and take it to the bank. If you are an adulterer, not somebody who made a mistake, now you are living in it. And you are doing it, and you are doing it with impunity, and you are writing books, and I buy your books, I will do what you are doing. So I'm very, very careful of what I consume. So I don't buy books, I buy integrity. Look for men and women who will groom you. Stop buying books 
because you want to show solidarity to a man of God. If he is not the kind of pastor you like to read his book, look for another one. There are many people who write books. Many people who write books. Make sure you look for people who have integrity. People who teach and model Christ. People who live the kind of messages they teach. And make sure you balance it. Don't have one pastor as your teacher. Make sure you have like four, five, six people. And make sure you balance it with Americans, Britons. Don't focus on Africans, Africans, Africans alone. There are many things that we know that they don't know. There are many that they know that we don't know. Theologically, they are sounder, more sound than us. So I have theologians that I read from. I have non-theologians. So when one is making a mistake, I will balance it in another person's book. And I have to do it. I buy, I don't know how many books in a year. Maybe 10 books or 15 books. I don't know. I should have bought like 12 now of, of 13 this year. I can't remember. Around that range. So I'm encouraging you. I know it's not easy. I mean, we all read at different paces. Even if it's only one book in a year, just try and buy it. These things will groom you. Lastly, you must elevate scripture above culture. Never allow what is said in the news or what is said in the White House or on social media to displace or demote the position of the world in your life. When you have that kind of mindset, your world life will shape your success. Satan will find you a hard nut to crack. Satan will have a dick about you. He won't smoke. He won't commit adultery. He won't beat people. He won't abuse people. He won't hate people. Where will Satan attack you? Tell me. In your marriage, you are like Christ. In your place of work, you are like Christ. In the marketplace, you are like Christ. In the church, you are like Christ. With your children, you are like Christ. With your wife or husband, you are like Christ. Tell me where Satan will attack you. Because you have effectively blocked all the loopholes through which Satan attacks. Satan will either attack from the place of work or attack in the marriage or attack in the church or attack in the children. You have put enough, enough barricades. That was what Satan did against Job. Satan went to God. He said, every place I try to touch, there's a barricade. Every aspect of Job's life is barricaded. <laughs> God had to give the devil permission because there was no loophole to Job's life. And Job had no Bible. Job wasn't born again. We don't have any excuse. Building on the world. To fulfill destiny. Building on the world. To fulfill destiny. I want us to pray before I give the altar call. I want us to pray for three to four prayer points today. And I'm going to shoot overshoot my time by 10 minutes. This is the last Sunday in the month of June. And we are effectively getting to the end of the first half of the year. A couple of our brothers and sisters, they visited us yesterday in our, in our house. Just had a little bit of beef, I mean, bit of a gathering together to share fellowship. And we prayed together and I led them to pray these prayer points. Please, I want to encourage you to spare five, six, seven minutes before you leave and connect to these prayers. I'm, I'm about to raise now. Please, please. One of the challenges we have when preaching on social media is because you cannot control people's choice to stay or go. If I'm preaching in the church now, it's hard for people to leave. I mean, they can leave, but it's going to be very hard. They have to look around. But on that one second, people can just click and leave the platform. And they miss out on so many things. Social media and, and online preaching is good, effective. We have reached people around the world, but it's not the best. Because you cannot control people's decisions. You don't know what they are doing. People can be listening to me now, and they are eating. They can be on their bed. They can be watching movies. And so they are distracted. I'm going to share a scripture 
in Jeremiah 33, verse 3. I just felt, felt led this morning to raise this prayer point and let us pray. Jeremiah 33, verse 3 says, Call unto me, and I will answer you, and I will show you great and mighty things that you don't know. I will show you, show you. A Greek scholar told us some years back that the word show in Greek means schedule or schedule. I don't know which one is correct. I'm not a linguist. Schedule, schedule, schedule. So that scripture should read like this. Call unto me and I will answer you and I will schedule you. I will schedule you. Who is the I there? God. So God has schedules. God is the greatest project manager the world has ever seen. Fortunately, I'm a certified project manager. So I understand what scheduling means. One of the pillars of any project, in fact, probably the second most important thing, apart from finance, is project schedule. God has scheduled for the year 2021. Six months have come. Six months are going now. I don't know whether you and I have met, have fulfilled God's schedule in the first half. I don't know whether the blessings that God has in store, what are the assignments, the instructions that God has in store for you in the first six months has been fulfilled. I don't know. But no football game, no football match is completed in the first half. Most sports in the world, not all of them, most sports in the world have first half and second half. We have completed first half now. We are going to second half. And God is a God of second chance. I don't know what exactly, I don't know what exactly God has in store for you in the second half of the year. We're going to pray. I want you to pray at every door that was supposed to open to me in the first half of this year that did not open. That God will make them to open in the second half. Lift up your voice and begin to pray in the name of Jesus. Every opportunity, every influence, every door that was supposed to open in the first half and did not open. This second half I am going they must open. Every program that God has for me, the agenda of heaven, the instructions I missed in the first half, that this second half of the year, that God will pack everything together and will give them to me in the name of Jesus. Begin to pray everyone under the sound of my voice. This second half of the year must not escape me. It must not escape me. Father, in the name of Jesus, every opportunity, Every network, every influence, every instruction, every door, everything that I need to connect with in the first time of this year that probably I missed. Father, we are entering to the second half. The second half blessing plus the first half blessing. Father, combine them and give them to me in the name of Jesus. Every instruction that I needed to have obeyed in February, in March, everything you are trying to tell me Every idea that I missed, I missed. And the Lord is impressing this in my heart. Many of you missed ideas. God had been opening your heart. Go and do this. Go and register for this. Go to this country. Leave this place. Do, and you are adamant and stubborn. And God has planted your breakthrough. He has planted your next level in that instruction, in that idea. And you did not obey it. It is not over yet. This is the second half of the year. Begin to cry to God as I step into July. Father, oh, every one of those doors, opportunities, blessings, ideas, instructions that I missed in the first half. Lord, let them locate me in the second half. In the name of Jesus, begin to cry to God. Begin to cry to God. Begin to cry to God. There is no football match that ends after first half. God is a God of second chance. This second half must not escape me. Father, by your message, 
Let them locate me. Every good thing I missed in the first half of this year, by your mercies, let them locate me. 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 In the name of Jesus. You know one thing, my friends. Call unto me and I will answer you and schedule you. I will schedule you. Great and mighty things you don't know. God of heaven has schedule. Satan of hell has schedule. When God is scheduling his own, Satan is scheduling his own. There are still many evil doors that Satan will open to many people in this next half of the year. But not you and your family. Not you and your family. You are going to lift up your voice and cry to God. Every door of untimely death, door of poverty, door of sickness, door of accident, door of failure, door of termination of employment that the devil has created, has scheduled for this next half of the year. Father, on my behalf and on the behalf of my family, shut them in the name of Jesus. Begin to cry to God. Father, shut them. Shut them. Shut them. Doors of evil. Shut them. Doors of accident. Shut them. Doors of untimely death. Shut them. Against my wife. Against my husband. Against my husband and wife. Against my children. Shut them. Shut them. Shut them. Every door of sickness that the, the devil is opening in this second half of the year. Shut them, Lord. Shut them. 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 In the name of Jesus, every single day of this next half of the year, Father, I hide myself in the secret place of the Most High, under the shadow of the Almighty. Every program of the devil, every agenda of hell that will be unleashed on the world, I will not be a partaker of it. Begin to cry to God. Begin to cry to God. I will not be a partaker of it. I will not be a partaker of evil. Evil shall not be my portion, my children's portion, or my family or husband's or wife's portion. In the name of Jesus, begin to cry to God. Terminate satanic schedules. Every satanic schedule against your life, terminate it. 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 By the blood of Jesus, cancel it. Begin to pray. Begin to pray. Begin to pray. Begin to pray. Father, we cancel them. We terminate them. We command every program of the devil written down concerning everyone under the sound of my voice today to catch fire now in the name of Jesus. Whether they are planning it under the sea or in the here, whether in the heavens or wherever, it is irrelevant. We stand on the authority in the name of Jesus and we command every door of evil that the enemy has a man for any one of us here to be shot in the name of Jesus. I command every door of sickness that the devil has opened concerning any one of us here under the sound of my voice. And the people who will come to watch this later, I command those doors to be shot. I shot them in the name of Jesus. Father, we give honor and glory to you this morning. If you are listening to me this morning and you are not saved, you pursue success so vigorously. You want to be this, you want to be that, you want to have house, you want to have car, you want to go to America, you want to win the presidency, you want to win the governorship, you want beautiful things but you don't have christ life without christ is full of crisis if you are born once you are going to die twice i don't know how to be politically correct when i'm talking about eternity the only language i understand is the language of spirituality i don't speak political correctness i speak spiritual correctness if you are born once you will die twice. But if you are born twice, you only die once. You are born once by your parents. You are not born again. You're going to die twice. You die physically and you die eternally. If you are born twice, you are born by your parents and you are born again. You only die once. 
I welcome you today into Jesus' free gifts, the gift of righteousness, the gift of salvation. Do not say, I will do it tomorrow. That was what D.L. Moody did. D.L. Moody went to preach in a particular village many, many years ago. The title of the message was this. What will I do with this Jesus? What will I do with this Jesus? He preached powerfully. He preached powerfully. Quoted all manners of scripture. At the end of the powerful message, he said to the crowd, go home. Everybody go home. He didn't give an altar call. He said, go home. Go and think about what you will do with Jesus. And come and tell me. Everybody erupted. They shouted. They laughed. They clapped. What a powerful meeting. That same night, there was an earthquake in the village. It wiped thousands of people away including many of those that came to the crusades. From that day forward, D.M. Moody said, he understood the urgency of the gospel. Never tell people to come back tomorrow. You may never see them again. You are listening to me today. You have a golden opportunity to accept Christ. I am not saying you're going to die. No, I didn't say that. Don't get me wrong. But I'm telling you, you don't have control over your life. Neither do I. I want you to make the greatest decision of your life by coming to Christ today. I want you to repent of your sins. I want you to bow down your heads wherever you are. If you want to give your life to Jesus and repent, tell Jesus to forgive you. Tell him that you are sorry for all that you have done. Tell him that you are sorry for all your sins. I want you to see this as the most important decision you can ever make in life. And it is true, it is. I want you to say those words after me. Say, Lord Jesus, I am sorry for all my sins. I regret so much for these sins. Please have mercy on my soul. Come and clean me up. Come and give me a new life. Come and give me the gift of righteousness. I want to be born Again, I want to be saved. If you have said those words honestly, I congratulate you. I congratulate you. Salvation is by faith, is by grace. And I want to advise and admonish you that now it has not ended. You need to find yourself a Bible and start reading the scriptures from the book of John chapter 1. And then I want you to look for a church not just any church. Prayerfully ask God to lead you to the right pastor. Don't use the number of cars, the size of church, the cloth of the pastor, the English is speaking as the basis for choosing your church. Please pray about it. If you can, talk to one or two, three believers that you know, that you trust, and then be prayerful about it. If it warrants it, you can visit two, three, four churches prayerfully before you make the final choice. It is a serious choice you're about to make. And when you find that church, be committed to that church, pray with them, study with them, walk with them, and God will bless you. Thank you so much, everyone. Next Sunday, we are starting another explosive series titled Empowered by the Spirit. That is a message you must not miss. Empowered by the Spirit. Part 1, Part 2, Part 3, Part 4. You will be mightily blessed. I will be on the radio in another three hours in Nigeria. And if you are free today, you can join us. www.32fm.com.ng And I want to ask that you subscribe to our YouTube channel. If you haven't subscribed, please, it's just one second. Rema for Living Ministries. Just type my name, Ayo Akereli. Rema for Living Ministries. And just click that bell. In just one second. Anytime I'm on YouTube or we're online, you will have notification. And then at the same time, there are hundreds and hundreds of teachings that will bless you and will influence your art for Christ on that platform. Thank you so much, my sister, on Instagram. God bless you so much. Thank you, everyone who joined on Instagram and on YouTube and on Facebook. 
I will see you again next Sunday. Have a great Sunday and a great day at work tomorrow. God bless you. God bless you all this morning. Hallelujah. God bless you all on YouTube as well.